So today is the last material, I believe. I'll double check. It's the last material. Now, here we go. Um, on Yes, the last material for the next exam. So I will be posting the practice test within the next 24 hours. Um, here's what we're looking at today. We're going to be doing, we're going to start doing volume problems. And that presents kind of an awkward situation because volume is three dimensional. We are doing the calculus of two dimensions. Calc one and two, we master the calculus of real numbers in two dimensions. Calc three is mastering it now in three dimensions using all of our calc one and two ideas. But we're going to take a little break from that and do a few problems where we can actually find volumes and surface areas and things. But here's our dilemma. When you only have one independent variable, how do you find volume? How do you find surface area? Well, it depends on the shape. See, for example, a sphere has only one independent variable, the radius. A cube has only one independent variable, right? The length of the edge. So there are shapes out there that are three dimensionals, but still only have one variable. And those are the kind of things we tend to gravitate towards. So here's our goal for today. I'm going to start with something simple. I'm going to start with a shape. Bounded. Okay, A, B, you know, the usual thing. And then what I'm going to do is take this region and I'm going to rotate it. <clears throat> I'm going to rotate it about the x-axis. I'm going to take this two-dimensional region and rotate it about the x-axis. So when I do that, what I'm going to get essentially um, this way, I'm going to get a three-dimensional shape. I'm going to rotate this about the x-axis to create a three-dimensional solid. The key is, though, it's a rotation. So I want to find the volume of the solid that I just generated by rotating this about the x-axis. Now, let's make one simple assumption, that the region I'm rotating is simple enough that I could have found its area. It's not a complicated region, because ultimately, this will involve integration. And we don't want problems that we can't find. So what do I do now? I'm going to slice it. Now, before, remember, we talked about doing all the slices all the way across and creating the Riemann sum and so on. But it was basically the one arbitrary slice that I needed. So let's call this, this will be the ith slice. And I'm going to square it off. Now, when I do that slice, is my shape a rectangle? No. If I lay this slice down, it's going to look like this. Okay, that's, that's a terrible picture. I know. You, you guys get the idea here. <laughs> it's three-dimensional. In fact, what does it look like to you? Well, if you like those little creepy sandwichy chocolatey things, what are those called? Uh, I was getting back. Is it Ding Dong? Klondike or like Bar. Klondike Bar. It, was it Ding Dong or a Ho-Ho? I can never remember which one's the round one. I never ate those things. Um, I like to refer to this quite simply as a hockey puck. When you make this slice, your shape is a hockey puck. It is circular with thickness. So technically, if it's circular with thickness, maybe if I lay it on its side, it'd be more obvious. What is this shape? What's the geometric name of the shape? A cylinder? So, yeah. A circular cylinder. Ah. Now, it's very thin, but think of like a, a can of tuna fish. Okay, you think of a can of tuna fish, you know, big round, but really thin. That's what this looks like. It's a hockey puck. It's, a, it's the mathematical term we use is a, it's called a disc. But if I use the term disc, that might be a little bit ambiguous to some folks. It's a hockey puck. It's a tuna fish can. It's a ho-ho ding-dong thing, whatever. Somebody said Klondike bar. You guys have a mental image of, of what the shape looks like. All I need to do is find the volume of one slice, then I can add them all up. All right, so how do I do that? Well, it is a circular cylinder. So the most important part, of course, would be the radius. What is the thickness? Well, the thickness technically would be my height, wouldn't it? But that thickness, that would be my delta x. So my thickness for the ith slice would be delta x. This would be my radius. But what's my radius? Oh, that's the height. I'll call that yi. Do you all agree with that? 
the radius of my disk is the actual y. The thickness is the delta x. So if I want the air, excuse me, the volume of this shape. Now remember, what is the volume of a circular cylinder? It's easy. It's the area of the circle times the height. So in this case, it would be pi r squared height. So just to remind you, the volume of a circular cylinder, and, and the circular part is important. The word cylinder has absolutely nothing to do with circles. The word cylinder is independent of circles. So I can have an infinite number of different shapes of the base and it's still a cylinder, but it's only a circular cylinder if the base is a circle. A lot of folks confuse that. Um, the volume of a circular cylinder of radius r and height h is pi r squared h. This is you know basic geometry formula that we learned as you know little math people. So I've got a circular cylinder. The radius is the y. The height, which is the thickness, would be my delta x. So that means the ith volume, I'll call it vi, is pi yi squared delta xi. And what's important now is what is the range of values on the x? Because the delta x is basically telling me, ultimately, I'm going to have to integrate with respect to x. So in this case, the x is between a and b. Now, I cannot have an integral with x and y both in it at the same time. So that's where I would go to the definition of what y is. So I would replace y then with f of x. But this is sort of a good generic starting point because it really depends on how I'm defining my original function. So we're going to do several examples of this. This is the most basic and the first of all the volume problems. It's also the least challenging in, in terms of setup and things like that. So let's say the region bounded by okay, the same language every time. Region bounded by, how about um, y equals x squared, y equals zero, x equals three, is rotated about the x-axis. Okay, I actually have to tell you which axis because I could just as easily make this problem rotated about the y-axis. That's not a big deal. In fact, we're gonna do exactly that. We're gonna do both axes at some point. Find the volume of the resulting solid. And this is sort of the universal language that we use for this type of question. I have to have a physical two-dimensional region to start with. I'm going to take that region and rotate it to create a three-dimensional shape. And it's always a very good idea to sketch the picture. Because if I don't sketch the picture and I try to do this in my head, I may have my boundaries incorrect. So I'm starting with y equals x squared. y equals 0, that's the x-axis x equal three. So when I rotate this, and I like to do like this. I'm rotating about the x-axis. What I'm gonna get is that. So I guess kind of a, a bugle. I don't know, that'd be a good. <laughs> what is the volume of this thing? Another way of thinking about this, if this is an empty shell, you know, how much water does it hold would be a really similar way of thinking about this. So in order to do this, I need to take an arbitrary slice. And so what does that slice look like if I lay it down? Okay, it looks like something like this. And again, that's yi, that's delta xi. So the volume of my i slice, which we just said was pi yi squared delta xi, Okay, well, what y am I going to use? I'm going to use y equal x squared. So this will become xi squared squared, which is pi xi. And the reason I write the xi is this is the volume of this one slice. This isn't the volume of my entire shape. 
So my first slice, I'd have ones. My second slice, I'd have twos. I have n slices, so this goes all the way up to xn. The actual volume, I'm going to write it one time, and then we're going to skip it from now on. The volume can be estimated by the sum from i equal 1 to n of all the little volumes, in other words, of these. Then the volume will equal the limit as the norm of the partition approaches 0. That's the largest such thickness. And eventually, I'm going to write a definite integral. The definite integral is going to look like this 100% of the time. So that's why I say we can skip all the in-between and we can go directly to volume equals pi x to the fourth dx. Now, what are my limits of integration? Hmm. Anybody want to try that one? What are my limits of integration going to be? Well, now I got to go back to my two-dimensional picture, by the way. What's the range of values on x in this case? Zero, Zero to three. Zero to three, good. Um, most of the time, I can't say all the time, but most of the time that should be actually quite easy. But if I don't draw the picture, you know, for example, what if I mistakenly took that region right there? That, that would be incorrect. But if I don't draw the picture, my mind might have produced a different area, which would give me a different answer. Now, this integration right here, absolutely trivial. So I have pi times one fifth x to the fifth from zero to three. So that would be 243 fifths pi. That's it. That's my answer, kind of ugly. But you notice there is a pi in my answer. What you're going to find is there's always going to be a pi in the answer because you're getting it through a rotation, which means there's something circular going on. The rotation is where the circles come from, by the way. Okay, the circle didn't come from here, it came from the fact that I rotated it. Now, this is a pretty generic example, but I don't think anybody would call this to be a difficult integration. Again, the whole problem is always about getting the integral correctly. Now, let's do a similar problem. Let me do a similar problem. Let's go y equal x squared, y equal zero. I'm going to change this now. I'm, I'm going to change a couple of things. Now let's do, how about um, y equals 9, and I want to go about the y-axis. So what changes? Hmm, let's see. This is not the same problem, but it's going gonna, it's gonna to look a little bit similar. By the way, the other one went to here, and then I rotated it this way. This one's going to go to here, but y equals 9. Oh, so I'm going to rotate it this way. Now, this actually has a name. I created a three-dimensional shape. We study these tremendously in, in Calc 3. It's our favorite shape because it's one of the simpler ones. This is actually called a circular paraboloid. Very cool name. It's a parabola in three dimensions because I just rotated it. All my cross sections are circles. But now when I do my slices, are my slices going to be vertical or horizontal? Anybody? Horizontal. horizontal. Why? You're right, but why? Because now it's a function of why? Keep it simpler. Keep it simpler. What? Vertical slices aren't going to help me. In my last example, we did vertical slices. Because my rotation went this way, the vertical slices are how I created the disc shape. So all of you, when you're looking at this going, the only way I'm going to get discs is if I slice it horizontally, because that's the way the circle is moving. So it's not, about, it's not about this. It's about how do I get discs. So a horizontal slice here will clearly produce a disc. That's why a vertical slice I don't know what that's going to look like, but it won't look round. See, a vertical slice won't look round at all. Um, so let's take this guy. Again, do the same thing we did before. So I make my little picture. I, I, I'm bad. Now, this time, what's my radius? My radius this time is the x, isn't it? And what's my thickness this time? That's the delta y. Oh, this is not the same problem. OK, this is why I don't like generically putting f of x in the function. No, put x or y and make your substitutions as necessary. So when I come up with my 
I slice its pi radius squared height. So it'll be pi xi squared delta yi, and this time the y's are ranging from zero to nine. Now, what's going to go here when I change it to y? Anyone want to try that one? Because this determines, I have to do it with respect to y. What's going to go here? I'm bounded by y equal x squared, and I have an x squared. It's the x squared term, but to have rest, no, 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 flip it around, so now it'd be y square root, square root of y, right? Because we're flipping it around. x to the fourth? No, it's y. How about just y? <laughs> if y equals x squared and I have an x squared. Oh, okay. That, that's why I said I never put function here. In the textbooks, they put function, which will give you the correct answer exactly 50% of the time. Why only 50%? Because it only works in one direction. We did a rotation in the other direction. So if I had put function there, I'll get the wrong answer 100% of the time. Don't put function, okay? Think radius, it's pi r squared. My radius is x. And when I do pi r squared, now I'm, when I substitute, oh, because one of you said it, well, I, shouldn't it be x to the fourth? But I'm not squaring the y, I'm squaring the x. So pi r squared, and then I substitute it out. That means that my volume, and by the way, most folks will just go ahead and pull the pi on the outside. Not only is that legal, it's probably a good idea just so it doesn't get in the way. Zero to nine y dy. That would be one half pi y squared from zero to nine or 81 halves pi. Now, I took the same curve and it was the same length curve. We went this way, we rotated it. I took this curve, cut it off this way, and we rotated it. First of all, were the shapes the same? This, this gumdrop, bullet, paraboloid shape, is that the same as the shape we got the other way? No, that was more like a bugle, right? That, that looked different. But also, I want you to notice the values. This volume was 81 halves times pi. What was the other one? It was like 243 fifths. I mean, they're not very, very far off, but they are not the same answer. So when I do a rotation about one axis and I do a rotation about the other axis with the same basic shape, no, it, you shouldn't expect that you get the same numerical answer because they're not the same three-dimensional shapes. This shape is different than the other shape. But again, the, the integration was not that difficult. So the idea here is if I do a rotation, I'm going to create a three-dimensional object, and I'm basically just setting up an integral of pi r squared. That's, that's pretty much what it is. Because my thickness is either going to be delta x or delta y, and that translates as the dx or the dy. So it's my integrand being some version of pi r squared. That's really all it comes down to. And that's, that's kind of a nice thing. Now, I said when you're doing an area problem, you can always set up an area with vertical cuts or horizontal cuts, whatever's more convenient at the time. But now I'm doing a rotation about an axis. So when I rotate it about the x-axis, I can't really do a horizontal cut there. That won't work. I have to do a vertical cut. When I rotate it about the y-axis, I really have to do a horizontal cut because I want to maintain those circles. Well, as it turns out, I think next day, yeah, next day we're actually going to learn another type of volume problem that involves a cut in a different direction, which will now give you the ability to set up any problem the way you want, you know, horizontal or vertical. But for what we're doing, we can only do one of those. We can only do horizontal, we can only do vertical, okay? Now, let's do a kind of an icky one, because icky sometimes is good, all right? The region bounded by... y equals the sine of x, y equals zero. Um, and let's say, and x is between zero and pi, is rotated about the x-axis. Find the volume of the resulting solid. So 
So what does this one look like? Well, essentially, I have a sine wave. Sine waves are infinite. Okay, they go forever. But I said, essentially, I want you to do this. Zero to pi, and rotate it. So I want, in simple terms, one hump of the sine wave and then rotate it. So when I rotate this, Okay, that, um, now that was awful. <laughs> Should kind of look symmetric. That's better. Now, is this a sphere, anybody? I'm going to take one piece of the sign. Of perfect sphere. sphere. Yeah. It also has a point on the ends. Yeah, first of all, is my sine wave, is one hump of the sine wave a semicircle? Mm. Is one hump of the sine wave a semicircle? That's actually an easy answer. Yes. Yeah. It depends on how you define a circle. Mm, whoa. How you define a circle? <laughs> well, well, because look, um, to, to that, it looks like there's points. And if you, a circle doesn't have a point, uh, points on it. So that okay. uh, so seems to me no. A circle will have vertical tangents. That slope is positive one, that slope is negative one. So you're right, they, they come to sharp points. No, it, it's not even similar to it. It's not even close. Here's an easy way to know. That's one unit, that's pi units, <laughs> right? So in other words, that's two units, that's pi units. Now, it, it's not round in any way. It's a curve, but it is definitely not. So a lot of folks make the mistake of thinking this is circular in terms of the shape. No, 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 no. My slices will be circular. This is not spherical. This is, I believe, lemon drop. Would that be the right description? Anybody? You know what a lemon drop is? It's like a clam. A lemon. Yeah, a clam. Yeah, that might even be a better one. I, I, I usually go with lemon drop on this one, but a clam. Yeah, that's not a sphere. A clam does not look like a basketball. So when I do my slice, just like before, and you'll get to the point where that's my Y. Without me drawing the circle, can I say then my volume is pi Y squared delta X? Can I say that in this case? Is everybody cool with that? without me even drawing the circle this time. Yeah, but I need to draw this to make sure because this isn't the only type of rotation we're gonna to do today. We're gonna to keep going. There's gonna be other types of problems. What is the range of values for X? Well, that's easy, <laughs> that's given. So now I need to replace the Y with this. So this is gonna be pi sine squared XI delta XI. And that brings a little bit of a problem. Now, I'm not sure we've done this much, but we, we have done this. We haven't done this recently. We have a problem in general. In general, we have a problem with these two integrals. Why, why do we have a problem with these two integrals, anybody? We don't have an antiderivative. <laughs> Good, we don't have an antiderivative formula. We do for sine and cosine, but not for sine squared. Oh. So this is where we have to employ the double angle formulas. This, I don't wanna say this is a ridiculously common problem, but it comes up often enough that it is really good to know where to go. I can't do this. So I have to use a double angle formula to get me where I wanna go. So I just wanna remind everybody, this is something, again, this was day one of the class we reviewed this. And that is the cos, let, let's keep it simple. The cos squared theta, I'll use this is one half one plus cosine of two theta. The sine squared theta is one half one minus cosine two theta. Okay, those are just from the double angle formula. And real quick check, if I add that to that, I should get one. If I add this to this, I will also get one, great. So that means when I'm doing this, I've actually got to use this because I can't integrate that, but I can integrate the double angle, that's easy. So I'm going to rewrite this as, pull out the half. So pi over two times one minus the cosine of two xi, okay? Now I have to do this. That's what I'm going to integrate, but that integration is not going to be a challenge. It's going to be easy. I just couldn't use this. So I've got to convert it, okay? So now I can say my volume is, Pi over two, I definitely want that on the outside. Zero to pi, one minus the cosine of two x dx. 
Okay. So it's pi over two x. What is the antiderivative of negative cos two x? Okay, I'll do my part. Uh, it's going to have a sign. Sign of what? Well, kind of has to be the same argument. What goes here? Plus or minus? Minus. The derivative of positive sign is positive cos. So I need a minus. Now, here's a nice thing. There's only two possible numbers that could go there. And neither one of them is a one. What are the only two numbers that I could even conceive of? It's either going to be a two or it's going to be a... A two or a what? Is this uh, for the chain rule for two X? What, what, what's going to go there? There's only two possible numbers when I'm doing derivatives and integrals. Remember, that's KX. There's only two possible numbers, the K or X, one over K. When you take a derivative, you multiply by the K. When you do an antiderivative, you multiply by one over K. That's an absolute what we've proved many, many times over. In other words, to not put anything there, to leave it as a one means that everything I said was completely wrong and nothing at that point will matter. You gotta commit. Well, when I differentiate sine 2X, I get a multiplier of two. So it's got to be a half. This is a this is a formal integration formula that we proved in class a few weeks back. Remember, when you have a constant multiple, the reciprocal of the constant is you can call it your chain rule. Yeah, that's what I need. I don't need to do a substitution. Though. That's the beautiful part. Most people will do a substitution. There is no substitution. This is a direct antiderivative. And how do I check if I differentiate this two times a half? Boom. Now. This shouldn't be taxing, but sometimes that is. Now, when I, when I substitute my pi and my zero, what do I get? I get pi over two times pi minus a half of the sine of two pi. Oh, you know, I'm not this. Minus zero minus a half sine zero. Now, What's the sine of zero? Sine of zero? Zero. Zero, okay, so this whole, that's gone. All right, what's the sine of two pi? Wait a minute, sine of two pi? One. Mm. Isn't two pi in the same position as zero? on the unit circle. So zero? So it's gotta be zero also. Oh, yeah, two pi, remember. Wow, everything's kind of leaving us. So what are we left with? So what's my answer? It's a weird one. Looks like pi squared over two. <laughs> that's kind of a crazy answer, but that's our answer. Yeah, no, there's nothing wrong with that answer, just not one we usually see. Now, the hardest part about this problem was not the integration, probably, but knowing how to do it, the changeover. When you have trig functions in general, they're easy. Re they're either really, really easy, or I have to use some identity. We, we always hope that we don't have to use an identity, but we know what we actually do know any identity we'd ever need to use. We already know that we're not going to derive new identities down the road. So this one here was a little bit more taxing. Now, I'm going to throw in a a tweakage to the original problem that we did. Uh, racing gets harder as I go on because the ink builds up on the eraser. Okay, now let's do a what if. All right, now I have the region bounded by y to the left of x and y to the g of x. Okay, big deal. And now I'm going to take this and I'm going to rotate it. Okay, that's my best. So, what did I just come up with? Uh, something with a hole inside of it. 
Oh, I like that the best. Oh, the washer? Um, I came up with something. I like it with a hole in the middle. Um, there's actually a mathematical term for that. It's called a tarus. A ring would be kind of specific. Um, does anybody know another word that people use loosely for the word? Taurus is actually the formal geometric name of it. A uh, donut? A donut, yeah. Because a donut, if you think about the inside of a donut, it's not flat, you get curvies all over the place. A taurus is like a donut. But what's a donut? A donut is kind of like a disc, I like what you said before, with a hole in it. Oh, I want to find this. Oh boy, that, that seems really, that seems much more complicated. Well, let's do an arbitrary slice of this thing. If I do an arbitrary slice, then what I'm going to get, again, squaring it off is important. I want to square it off so that I don't have roundness. Now what I've got Okay, I'm doing my best trying to get a little shading there. Now, when we did a problem the other day, when we first did the area problems and I did this area, didn't we say, let's just take the big area and subtract the little area? I mean, isn't that how we did it? So this shape here, isn't this a disc with a disc removed? Does everyone see that? This basically, a, I'm removing a disc from a disc. So can I think of this as just the subtraction of disks? Does, would that work, do you think? Yes. Think, yeah, it's exactly what's going on. Big disk minus little disk. Now, the shape that we call this one, we called the big thing a disk. We can't call this a disk because we have a hole in the middle. I think Nate said it. What's, it, what's the term we use for this guy, Nate? A washer. We call this a washer. So if you think about, you know, nuts and bolts and screws, you go, oh, that's what a washer looks like. It's flat, circular, but there's a hole in the middle. So if I want to find the volume of this guy, it's actually not that bad. Let's call that R1 and let's call that R2, radius one, radius two. And again, that thickness is delta Xi. So then if I want the volume of this, really what I'm going to say is it's the big disk pi R1 squared delta Xi minus pi R2. 2 squared delta xi. But I can clearly factor that like this. Ah, so in this case, what I would do, whatever the outer radius is, I, I, I have to be giving you the functions. In other words, whatever the f of x is, I'd put there, and whatever the g of x is, I'd put there. And then I would simplify that if I could. Hopefully that would not be a complicated process. And so what we have is it's really the same method. This really is the disk method, but technically it's like the disk method done twice within the problem because I have big disk minus little disk. So the first thing we do is we lump these two methods together because they're really the same method. You don't decide if you have a hole in the shape. When you do your rotation, you go, oh, there's a hole in my shape. <laughs> Right. If there's no hole, then it's a disc. If there's a hole, then it's a washer. But it's really the same method. It's the pi r squared, you know, times the thickness. So I generally will lump these together. And the instructions I use, I say disc slash washer. And that's the method. It's the disc slash washer method, because it really is the same method. If I took away the g of x and we went all the way down to the axis, then when we rotated, we got one big solid and we called that the disc method. By putting the second shape in there, we now just cut a hole into our disc with a smaller disc. So now it's the washer, but it's still the same ultimate method. So let's do a problem that we've already looked at today. All right. The region bounded by Let's do the first problem we did today. Uh, y equal x squared, y equals zero, x equal three is rotated, well, we already did this problem, about the y-axis. Oh, when we did this problem the first time, we rotated it about the x-axis. 
Okay. Oops, I need more room here, sorry. So the first time we did the problem, we took this thing, we rotated it this way. Now I want you to take this thing and rotate it this way. Hmm. What is that going to give us? What, what kind of, I mean, if I had to give a loose description of that, what, what would that be kind of like? Is that the, like the, op, like the inverse of the paraboloid? You know, like the, uh, no, that's the your negative bowl. space. A you bowl? <laughs> a bowl, yeah. I mean, it was more like a bowl or a vase or something. Uh. <laughs> yeah. Now, I like what you said before. You said, could I use my previous result? Well, technically, yeah, but I'll actually be making it much more complicated. We, we'd rather just compute this directly. But, but Jeremy has a point. You know, if I squared this off, it's sort of like I got this big thing and I'm taking the, the paraboloid out. But again, that's, that's too much. That, that would require multiple problems. It wouldn't be incorrect. It just wouldn't be the most efficient way. So because I went around the y-axis, do I want vertical or horizontal cuts here? Horizontal. Horizontal, to keep horizontal. horizontal, but my horizontal cuts now will leave a big hole in the middle, won't they? Ah, so when I do this horizontal cut, it will not be a disc, it will be a washer. Not because I chose to make it a washer. No, there's, there's a big old hole in the middle. So that's why I said, when you're doing your slices, you don't, you don't choose which method you're gonna do. It's, do I have a hole or do I not have a hole? I have a hole. So in this case here, when I draw that, okay, I'm gonna go this way. Um, so I'm gonna take it go this way. What is my inner radius? My inner radius, that's my inner radius. Oh, that's just the X. Wh whatever X is, that's my inner radius. Now, this is not complicated, but I gotta get this part right. What is my outer radius? What is this radius? Well, it's the same, isn't it? All the way up and down. This is not a variable. What's this radius? Three. R1, R3. No, not an or. <laughs> That's the line x equal three. So this radius is clearly three. Now, as I move up and down, every slice here, the inner radius is going to change, isn't it? Because the inner radius is the x value, but the outer radius is always the number three. That's, that should not be ambiguous in any way, <clears throat> but I need that in order now to set up my problem. So we said a moment ago that volume is pi outer radius squared minus inner radius squared. In this case, it'll be delta yi. The y values will range from, from what to what? Well, that point, just like before, that point was three comma nine. So my y values are not going to go zero to three. My y values are going to go zero to nine. Now I'm not quite there. Those variables have to match and that decides. So I need to change x squared in terms of y. Well, that makes it kind of easy, doesn't it? I'm going to replace x squared with, with y. So this will be pi times nine minus just yi. Huh. Now, this part here is absolutely necessary, absolutely critical in every problem that we do, all the way through three semesters of calculus. What we're doing today, we will repeat in different versions. When we create the arbitrary, I'll call it slice, in this case, the arbitrary washer, if I can describe the volume of that washer, then it makes it very easy to set up the integral because the integral is going to look like this. I don't have to actually do the Riemann sum and do the limit and all that. I can just go right to the integral, but I can't go from the problem to the integral. Because when I'm reading this problem, does anybody see this when they're reading this? Probably not. I got that from the picture and, and doing my, you know, my work on the side. But now I can say the volume is pi times the integral from zero to nine of nine minus y dy. And that will be pi times 9y minus 1 half y squared from 0 to 9. So that would be pi times 81 minus 81 halves or 81 halves pi. 
So the washer method is because I basically had two curves really involved in the problem. You said, but you only had one curve. No, I didn't. I had, I had y equals this and I had this. And when I rotated it, if I had just taken that curve and rotated it, I would have had the parabola, the, the solid. But I took this boundary and rotated it. That created the gap. But if I had taken this boundary and gone this way, there would have been no gap. So you can't really predetermine. And one of the questions I like to ask, we have now taken this region. We did it around the x-axis. That was the first example. And now we did it around the y-axis. I love to ask that question. I think that's what is on your next quiz. I will give you a simple region and ask you to rotate it about both axes and then calculate the volume. You shouldn't get the same answer because the shapes are not exactly the same. But it, it forces you to now think, OK, I have these are delta x cuts. These are delta y cuts because I must maintain that circular cross section in order to apply this technique. All right. So now where this gets, we'll make this a little more interesting. How about <clears throat> you know, keep it fairly simple. The region bounded by, how about, um, I'll do x, sorry. x equals y squared and x equal two is rotated about, ooh, about the line x equals negative one. Find the volume of the resulting solid. OK, this is different. I did not rotate it about an axis. So does that make this harder? Does it make it weirder? Isn't it just the, yeah, it's just the negative one, and then it's the still the, technically the, now the y-axis just being rotated? So here's what I've got. I've got this right here. I'm not rotating it about the y-axis. I'm rotating it. about that axis. So that would mean it's about. Everybody see that? Okay, it's supposed to look the same, but. Oh, okay, I'm not rotating it about the Y axis, but I am rotating it about a vertical axis. So it shouldn't be very different. The rule is if I rotate it about an axis or about a line that's parallel to an axis, there's really no difference. If I had rotated it about a diagonal line, this would be beyond the scope of this course. That's not even something you'd do in count three. To rotate it about an axis that's not parallel to the X or Y would make this so ridiculously difficult. And it would involve so much more than we are capable of doing. In fact, you know, the best calculus students would be hard pressed to do that problem because I'd have to employ what's called a rotation of axes, which you're gonna learn next semester. And it's just evil at that point. So I need to do this problem. Because I rotated this way, I definitely want to go with horizontal slices. OK. Now the tricky part is when I'm describing this, I think we all agree there's going to be a disk. Excuse me. Uh, it's not going to be a disk. It's going to be a washer. Oh. I've got my inner. I've got my outer. And I, I do this problem the same way every time I do it. Now, my slices are clearly delta y. So that's not ambiguous in any way. What is my inner radius? Now, remember, you're measuring it from the dotted line here. You're measuring it from the line y equals negative 1. Now, are you measuring it to the left or are you measuring it to the right? I don't want this to be tricky. You took this shape and rotated it. So this is your radius. And how far is that? Well, I know from here to here, that's just the x-coordinate. So what is it from here to here? The x-coordinate plus negative 1? 
Mm, but that would be x minus one. How about x plus one? So in other words, your subtraction is correct, but I'm subtracting negative one. Because you said right, it should always be right minus left, and you're correct. From here to here, it'd be x minus zero. From here to here, it'd be x minus negative one, which is the same as x plus one. Okay, so wherever I am, I'm going to add one more unit to get to there. I'm not going to subtract a unit. That's one more unit further. Now, what is this distance? Well, that's a vertical line. So won't this distance remain constant? Now this subtraction is more useful. This is the line x equal 2. How far is it from the line x equals negative 1? Anybody? What's that distance? 3. It's 3. And that's, if you will, 2 minus negative one. The problem is if I add them, I'm only going to get a distance of one and, and that no work. Whoops, I put, sorry, I put this in the wrong place. That's, I don't have any room here. That's xi plus one, that's three. I think what we just did was the hardest part of the problem, figuring out what are the individual radii. That really shouldn't be taxing, right? The outer radius is clearly a constant, it's three. The inner radius is this distance, which clearly changes, but it's always plus one. So now I can say the volume of my i-th slice is pi times outer radius squared minus inner radius squared okay now what do I do with this well that's going to be let's let's go ahead and multiply that out so this would be xi quantity squared plus 2xi, so minus 2xi, plus 1, so minus 1. So finally, in terms of the x's, it would be 8 minus the square of xi minus 2xi. But I'm integrating ultimately y. Oh, so I need now to substitute. Well, if x equals the square of y, then everywhere I see an X, what should I replace it with? What should I replace the X's with? Uh, y squared. Y squared, yeah. That, that shouldn't be complicated. And immediately someone's gonna say, oh, square root. If X equals Y squared, then I'm gonna take X out and replace it with Y squared, not something else. That would just be, well, that would be crazy. And we're not crazy, I don't think. So that's y squared, right? x squared is y squared squared. So that's going to be y to the fourth. That's just 2x, so that'll be 2y squared. So if I have made no errors, I finally now know exactly what I'm going to integrate. And I'm pretty sure it'd be safe to say there's no way you would have ever gotten this from this, <laughs> just looking at it. No, you, you got to actually, you got to do all of this. And the picture is definitely the most important part of this process. Without the picture, I, there's no way I'm coming up with these boundaries. But once I did that, now my integration is going to be of this. And here's the wonderful part about this problem. I'm now going to state, oh, by the way, what is the range of values for y? I've erased stuff. What is the range of values for y? Let me go back to our, I apologize, I erased this. This was um, two comma. What is the what is the y value here? Four. You sure? If x is two, two, two right? Because that's where it's cut off. Because that's the x line. Yeah, the x coordinate is clearly two. What's the y coordinate then? Uh, four. No. Yeah, that's what I was gonna say. Okay. Two equals y squared. I'm pretty sure y is not. Oh, I see. Square root two. Square root. Oh, yeah. We. I. I apologize. I erased this prematurely. I. I need that point, don't I? Because that means this one is two negative root two. Oh, so what are my limits of integration? Remember, we're doing y integration. So this is going to be negative root two to two. Oh, sorry, root negative root two to root two. Okay, 
boy, this one, this one presented some challenges in, in terms of the setup. Now, what is often the case in, in, any, in any calculus class, what would often be the case, believe it or not, is the question would be the region bounded, blah, 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 set up the integral to find the volume of the resulting solid, which would now mean I am done. Yeah, would you call this a challenging integral or an easy integral based on what you guys know and all the stuff you've been turning in lately? Would you say easy, hard? I'd say that's, that's, that's as easy peasy as it gets. You're integrating a polynomial. I mean, there's, there's nothing about that that's difficult. But coming up with that, yeah, whew, that was some work. I lost some weight doing this problem. You know, I got to work out. This is the whole problem is this. I kind of give you the benefit of the doubt at this point that, you know, that should really be a simple integration. I'm integrating a polynomial. Think of the quizzes you just turned in. You had complicated problems where you had to do substitutions and change of variables and problems of these natures. You will rarely have to do any form of substitution. You're just not going to get that complicated of a problem. Now, I do want to evaluate this all the way to the end. Does anybody see something that might be handy before I do my next step? You notice anything? Metric. Uh... Inter you see symmetric inter limits. Symmetric limits of integration. And, but that's a even function. And an even right. function. If it's not an even function, then it doesn't make any difference, right? But it's an even function with symmetric limits. So I can definitely make my life easier by doubling that and going from zero. Every problem that you can do this, you should. You say, but you just took an extra step and I've also eliminated more than one step and the most complicated part of the problem I just eliminated. Evaluating it, the antiderivative, which will be odd at negative limits of integration. That's where we make most of our mistakes. I just eliminated the part of the problem that would give us the most fits. So I'd rather do this problem. So my answer is two pi, now eight y minus one fifth y to the fifth minus two thirds y to the third. I'm gonna have some fun because this answer is gonna be just nasty, or so we think. I don't need a calculator to do this, but I do have to be on top of things here. So I'm gonna get two pi. Now, by the way, here's one of the things you love about this. If I have an even function and I can double it, the antiderivative of an even function is odd and all odd functions evaluated at zero are zero. So I don't actually have to do this. It's an absolute mathematical law that that's going to be zero, whether I even, I'm not even going to look at it. I already know it's zero because it's the antiderivative of an even function. So that's one of the reasons you like doing this. You only have to evaluate it here. Ah, life is good. So I've got eight root two minus one fifth. I'll write it this way. Root two to the fifth power minus two thirds root two to the third power. Big yikes. But I'm going to have a single root two in each of these cases. Let's make our life easy. Root two squared is two. Root two to the fourth power, therefore, is four. So root two to the fifth power should just be four root two. Root two squared is two. So root two to the third power should just be two root two. My final answer is just going to be a multiple of root two. I'm not going to have a sum. My answer is going to be just something times root two. Very specifically, what times root two? Well, right now I have two pi eight minus four fifths minus four thirds root two. See, I'm lazy. <laughs> I'm not gonna keep rewriting the same thing. So let's do the coefficient. Use your fraction key. So eight minus four fifths minus four thirds but I also have this two here, so times two, and that gives me 34 thirds. So my answer is 34 thirds pi root two. The order you write those does not matter, by the way. You'd write whatever order you like. But my final answer, we expected the pi. We didn't expect the root two, but that's what it is. Had I given you friendlier limits, I still would have had to evaluate. I still would have used the fact that it's an even function. I still would have done all that stuff. This one just is a little bit ugly, that's all. So big picture now. 
I have a region in the XY plane and it has to be a region that I could have easily found the area of. We're not finding the area of that region, but it has to be a region I can find the area of because it has to be a region that is not so complicated that it involves techniques maybe we haven't even learned yet. So I, I take a region, I rotate it about an axis that either creates one solid or a solid with a hole in the middle. I don't, I don't choose, I just observe. And then I set it up and I go from there, okay? So let's do another one. This will be the last one and I'll, I'll, I promise to make this one evil because I know you guys love that kind of stuff. All right. Let's consider the region bounded by. Okay. Um, okay, I'm, uh, I'm first quadrant because there's also a second quadrant portion. Find the volume of the resulting solid. That might seem redundant, but next week we're, I'm going to ask a question, find the surface area of the resulting solid. You know, there's, there's other questions that can be asked of the resulting solid. Huh, okay, so what does this look like? Well, I have the first quadrant portion. So the cosine is going to be that. So I have the, X axis, the Y axis, and the cosine, but I said the first quadrant, because otherwise there'd be a second quadrant portion. But I'm now going to rotate that. No, actually, I need to make this a little smaller, so I'm going to fit. All right, so. Way the heck down here. Oh, sorry, this is going to be hard to see. Can everybody see that? <laughs> I said, huh. Well, we did one like this. We did this one with a parabola recently. So when I do my arbitrary slice, okay, pretty obvious I'm going to get a washer. So again, I can draw my generic picture so I can figure out. Yeah. All right, well, the inner radius is easy. This is the inner radius. Anyone want to try that one? It's the distance between the line y equals zero and the line y equals negative two. So what would that value be? Four. Four? No, just two. Oh, just two. <laughs> yeah, I'm going from here to here. That's just two. So zero minus negative two, if you will. However you look at it, hopefully you came up with that's a distance of two. That's my inner radius. What's my outer radius? Oh, my outer radius is this distance plus two more. So that would be the y distance plus two. That's my outer radius. Everybody cool with that? Hopefully that makes some sense to you. It doesn't have to make a lot of sense, but a little sense. So I believe the volume of my ith slice is going to be pi times the square of the outer radius minus the square of the inner radius. And it's going to be delta xi. What are the values of x going to range from? Ooh, I need to know what is that point right there? Where does the cosine graph hit the axis? What is that? Uh, that's pi. Is it pi? Are you sure. Cosine of what is zero? Cosine of pi is negative one. Cosine of pi would be down here. Pi over two. Pi over two. Good. 
By the way, this is what I'm telling you guys. Have your brain convert your thinking to, to degrees if it helps. Cosine of 90 degrees, I know is zero. Okay, pi over two. I don't care if you convert things to, to degrees in your head or even to do it and then go back to radians. If you are not comfortable, I am very comfortable thinking in radians. In fact, I'm more comfortable thinking in radians than I am degrees because I use radians a lot more than degrees. But I need that value. So it's sort of by hook or by crook, you, you got to get that. And if it helps to think it to think it in degrees in order to come up with the right thing, that's okay. It's always okay. You just can't give an answer in degrees because pi is a measurement, a degree is an arbitrary unit. In the sense, a, a simple example of that would be: um, we know that units historically units changed. The, the the length of a foot, for example, was not uniform. Did you know that a cup was not uniform for hundreds and hundreds of years? Did you? So you're you're a trader in a in a foreign country, and you go to this land, and you're gonna you know, you're gonna trade whatever you know precious metals pelts whatever you're you're but you don't know what the exchange rate's going to be because it kind of depended on who was in charge who was the king at the time you see <laughs> so it's kind of funny do you know what the measurement of a cup was in historically for hundreds of years whatever the king drank out of his chalice that's what's defined to be a cup so if you got a really big king you had a really big cup which means you got a lousy exchange rate at the other end a cubit that's biblical. A cubit is a measurement. Most people say it's around 18 inches. No, a cubit technically is the distance from your elbow to the tip of your finger. <laughs> so if you got really long arms, a cubit, well, a cubit was what they measured. They didn't use feet. They used cubits to measure lengths. <laughs> but if you had a king with a long arm versus a king with a short arm, it wasn't really until the metric system came around that we had a uniform standard of length. And the metric system wasn't arbitrary. It came from the estimated circumference of the earth and then we broke it down into smaller units ah that's that's one of the reasons that that's considered a standard because that hasn't changed but other things have now a foot is a foot but what was the length of a foot do you suppose historically hmm, that's a really tricky one that's kind of on the order of the color of an orange what was the length of a foot the king's foot. <laughs> the length of the king's foot. <laughs> that's like, if that's not the ultimate ode, oh, people are like, really? Yeah, that's exactly what the length of a foot was. <laughs> so if a king had big feet versus, I have fun with this because units should not change their meaning, but they did. Historically, they always changed their meaning. You know, it, it depended on, you know, um, they always have fun with that. So we, we don't want that to be the case. So a radian is a measurement having to do with circular stuff. So this is pi i squared plus four pi i plus four minus four. Ooh, I like that. So now I'm gonna sub in this, but I didn't need to yet. So this is now pi times. The square of the cosine of xi plus four times the cosine of xi delta xi. Well, that's not so bad. That's not so bad. Oh, wait a minute. I got the square there. That means I got to use that double angle formula again. Eh. Oh, well, it happens. So I'm going to replace this with one half, one plus the cosine of two xi. That's going to go right here. And then the rest of this is going to stay intact. Okay. So now I'm going to go ahead and erase my picture here. So now I can say volume is pi times. And we deemed zero to pi over two, by the way. We, we know that's the correct boundaries here. So I'm going to have this. I'm going to go ahead and distribute the one half. I don't see any point of not. So one half plus one half times the cosine of 2x plus four times the cosine of x. Now I can erase this, dx, okay? That, that was taxing coming up with the integral. It should not be taxing to evaluate the integral. One half x. All right, I know I'm gonna have a sine of two x. I know I'm gonna have a sine of x. Okay, we agree with that. 
Now let's get our coefficients right. Everybody, this should not even be something you have to think about. What's, what's going to go here, plus or minus? Plus. Plus. What's going to go here, plus or minus? Plus. plus. Well, okay, good. Half the battle. Coefficient. One half. Uh, sorry. No. Take out one over two. When I take my derivative, I have to get this back again. So one over four, because then when I differentiate, boom. Yes. Because I get the I get the extra half in front on the integration. Because when I differentiate this, I'm going to get cos two x times two, and that gives me back to here. But nothing weird going on here, so that's just four. Okay, so far so good. Everybody cool with that? From zero to pi over two. So now I'm going to do the easy route. When I when I do a zero, I'm going to have zero sine of zero, which is zero sine of zero, which is zero. So the zero end is all zeros. It is it is dangerous to assume when you evaluate a function at zero, you're automatically going to get zeros because that's not always the case, right? If I have an e to the x. If I have a cosine of x, if I have a secant of x, evaluating at zero will not produce zero. So sometimes we just automatically wipe out the zeros, but be careful. In this case, all of these will be zero when I evaluate at zero. I like that. All right. So one half times pi over two plus one fourth times the sine of pi plus four times the sine of pi over two. Hmm. Any freebies here? Yeah. What's the sine of pi? Negative one. Okay, this one I'm, I'm hoping. Zero. That's zero. What's the sine of pi over two? One. One. Oh. Again, danger is that we just start throwing zeros around. So I've got pi over four plus one times pi. Can I just leave it like that? Is there any, I, I can manipulate this in, in a variety of ways. That's an irrational number that can't be, I can't combine anything. Can I just leave it like that? What do you guys think? Yes. Sh should I keep going maybe is a better question. You if could that, when you get this pi, pi over pi squared over four plus pi. Okay, that's absolutely correct. Is that an improvement? Or is it basically just the same thing? Yeah. What if I factored out the one fourth and I wrote it as pi over four times pi plus four? That's the same thing too. That's that's most likely going to be a textbook answer, by the way. Um, they're all the same thing. And I just I don't see one being better than the other. It's not like a log where oh, I can use log properties to combine them, or I have the log of one, which is zero. It's I have some irrational numbers. So if there's no gain from manipulation, then just walk away and wave at it. Because what's the problem if you manipulate that answer? Tell me. What's the problem? Might make, might make a mistake. Might make a mistake. And you have flawless work, and you decide to go one step additional, which wasn't actually necessary, and now we make an error. Now, none of us have ever done that, of course, right? Taken it one too far and then made an error. But you know somebody who has, I'm sure. You know, that person sits to your left in, in a classroom. No, I say, if, if I'm not going to gain by keep going, just leave it alone. If, 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 that's absolutely correct. That's absolutely correct. I just go with the first answer typically, unless there's an obvious simplification. That's always the term I use. If you see an obvious simplification, take it. This is not a good final answer. You can't leave the answer in this form because you can easily evaluate both of these. Yet, on, on the last quiz, that was the most common type of mistake. And that is an error. People were leaving answers in this form saying, really, sine of pi over two, you don't want to give me a number or, or worse, I have something that's actually zero. I had somebody leave log one as an answer in the last quiz, but log one is zero. <laughs> Take advantage of that. You know, and if all else fails, I don't know what log one is. You know, I don't even have to be in radian or degree mode. When I hit log one on my calculator and then I hit, oh, okay. <laughs> there are certain things that are just right there. We want to take advantage of them. Okay, that's as far as I wanted to get today. 
this is the end of the exam material. It's not the end of volumes. We're actually, we have two more techniques for finding volumes for different types of problems, but those will come actually next day. So here's an interesting thing. We're at the end of week 13 right now. Final exam is three weeks from today, but we only have two more lectures. The next two classes are the last two lectures of the semester, because after that we have an exam, review, review, final exam. So you've got, you know, 20, where are we? You have 24 of the 26 lectures that are gonna be on the final. And I'm pointing that out because part of your preparation for exam three, you're automatically reviewing for the final. You see, as you practice and really get into your integration techniques, aren't you automatically reinforcing your derivatives? Isn't that automatic? Because you can't integrate if you can't differentiate. That's a higher level of thinking. So if I'm able to integrate it's, or this way, then it's because I could differentiate and reverse. So I always remind people when you're, this course builds upon itself. It's not a bunch of separate topics. So at the end of the course, a lot of what you did was review without even intending it. No, you haven't been reviewing limits, but you certainly should be more solid on derivatives as a result of integration. Now, all of your application problems, again, you're reinforcing the basics of integration because every problem here on out involves some form of integration, although not a lot of substitutions. Okay, we will do one more class that will be a week from today where we have some substitutions as part of uh, finding the answers. That would be uh, surface areas and arc lengths and things like that. But anyway, we're, we're at a really good place right now. So hopefully you guys stay on top of stuff. Let's go ahead and stop now.